So primary prevention of ACEs involves talking to the parents before these ACEs could, could, could occur. So I think that really begins in infancy, so talking to parents about the importance of reading to their children, talking to their children, giving them their children full attention. I also think it's important for families to remember that having a new baby is a huge change. So at the one month checkup, I always tell my parents, start planning your date night. Don't feel guilty. Happy kids have happy parents. In terms of examples of primary prevention, one case I had was a family that came in and the mom was struggling with behavioral problems at daycare and at home. She was a single mom. You know, the first question I usually will ask is, well, what do you do for discipline? Um, and that's when I learned that she was spanking the child, not employing any type of timeout, not employing any type of reward system, not catching them when they were being good, but that was what she knew. She had been raised by a single mom as well, and um, she said, that's well, I didn't know there was another way. I didn't realize that you know, other methods were just as effective. And so um, I talked to her about catching them when he was being good, reinforcing the positive behaviors and ignoring the negative behaviors, um, and then employing a timeout if needed. But most children will respond much better to positive reinforcement. So um, in this way, we are hoping to minimize the ACEs that occurred when she was a child and change things for the second generation. Secondary prevention signs that you're at risk for ACEs. Uh, uh, on all age levels, we see these kids who have difficulty uh, toilet training. They're too stressed out to relax. It could be constipation, it could be stress. Mommy is just yells, uh, she's a little bit also stressed out. Sleep, if they're constantly aroused, it's no time to sleep, so you have sleep disorders, eating disorders, constipation, chronic manifestation of, uh, somatic manifestation, headaches, chronic abdominal pain. So those, are, those will be signs for me that I need to in, engage into secondary prevention. Tertiary prevention, how to implement that? Uh, we like to think of a social medical model of care where we start with the individual, creating trust, letting the patient to confide to you, feel accepted, not judgmental, not criticize, know that you are a resource for that patient or family. The second aspect is the family. So you get, you engage both mom and dad. Community and social at large. So tertiary prevention will be, this is the time to make a referral. This is the time to contact uh, DFACS or um, get a psychology involved. Uh, maybe through a non, faith-based faith organization, um, bring the support of the family. I don't use family and children's services as a means to scare families. Um, I always explain to them that they're there to help families to ensure that the child is safe and that they are safe and that it's important that we have a safe environment for the child. And I also en encourage the families to seek professional help if they're having anger management issues or dealing with depression or anxiety themselves. Most of the families that I've had to refer to Family and Children's Services, I've sustained relationships with them because I mean, the parents, they want to be happy too. The kids want to be happy. And you know, no one says I want to wake up and abuse my kid today. These are families under a lot of stress. These are families who don't know how to cope with their emotions, their anger, and so giving them resources, different ways of channeling those emotions and teaching them. A lot of it's behaviors they learned as children um, and changing that so that the next generation doesn't experience it. Some efforts span primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. For instance, Dual generational approaches provide opportunities to meet the needs of vulnerable children and their parents together. Parents' well-being is crucial to children's social, emotional, physical, and economic well-being. A healthy child is a reflection of the health of their parents or caregivers. By addressing the needs of both parents and children together, both generations can benefit. Dual generational programs and policies support quality early childhood education educational attainment, economic strength, social capital, and the health and well-being of both children and parents 
to create a legacy of economic security and well-being that passes from one generation to the next. Because parents' outcomes and children's outcomes, both positive and negative, are so tightly linked, developing dual generational practices is imperative. The key to children's healthy development is having parents or other caregivers who are physically, mentally, and emotionally healthy so that they can provide safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments for their children. Positive parent-child relationships give kids a much better chance of reaching their full potential. When parents are able to reduce their own stress and anxiety, they can better respond to their children's emotional needs and help them weather difficulties. They also can model appropriate behaviors so that their children can learn how to deal with stress appropriately. Therefore, parents must have opportunities to take care of their own health, physical, mental, and emotional. And they must have opportunities to get treatment for their own childhood trauma if needed. In the medical realm, certain practices can have a major impact on a family's ability to thrive. Examples of these practices include continuously supporting mothers during pregnancy, labor, and after birth, promoting responsive parenting and parents' health. The American Academy of Pediatrics also recommends that medical providers consider a patient's economic status to assess a parent's access to resources that can help them manage stress and parent successfully. It may be necessary to refer parents to services that can help families address their needs. Early childhood development programs like home visiting, child care, Head Start and Early Head Start programs and pre-kindergarten through third grade education are gateways to dual generational approaches that focus on parenting skills and the needs of parents while providing child development activities. These and other early childhood development programs can provide an inviting climate that facilitates social connections among children as well as parents and caregivers. They can provide a central point of contact or a referral hub for available community services. And these programs can create linkages between child and adult services, helping both generations to learn and thrive together. As a medical provider, you can talk with patients and their families about the importance of dual generation health and wellness, and make referrals to supportive services and programs that can help parents and caregivers break the intergenerational transmission of ACEs. When pediatric medical providers consider and take action to support the health and well-being of parents and caregivers, they can make a big difference in their patients' lives. Treating a child who has experienced ACEs or other adversities, then sending them home to an unwell caretaker, doesn't fix the problem. Taking a dual generational approach means actively engaging with parents and caregivers to identify any support, referrals, or recommendations they may need. For instance, you may learn that a parent spanks their child as a form of discipline. After talking with the parent about this issue, you might learn that the parent was spanked as a child and lacks information about or experiences with positive parenting strategies. By talking with the parent, offering recommendations, and providing additional resources, information, and referrals, you can help the parent understand and adopt positive parenting strategies that can protect your patient from future spanking and other adverse experiences. Take a minute now to answer a few questions.